Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks for coming. My name's Sophie and I'm going to be talking about OpSAL for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, just bear with me, I'm aware there's quite a lot to get through, so I'll have to really power through this and move pretty fast. Um, but if you just hang out to the end, we've got some MCQs. I've gone through like the faculty papers and found all the OpSAL questions and we can discuss those. Um, and hopefully my slides, they're pretty wordy, but hopefully there'll be a good resource for you to study off um, later in the year as well. So we'll get started with some anatomy and then some pathology that correlates with the various anatomical regions we're talking about. And then we'll move on to pathology. So causes of a red eye, causes of gradual and then sudden visual loss. And then we'll get to the MCQs um, at the end. So to get started, the eye can be broadly divided into three layers. So you've got the inner neural layer, which is the retina, um, the middle vascular layer, which is the a few structures that are continuous with each other. So the iris at the front um, that moves into the ciliary body and then the choroid around the um, rest of the eye, and then the outer fibrous layer. So the cornea is the transparent part at the front, and then the sclera is the white of the eye. Um, the retina, a couple of things to draw your attention to. So we've got the macula and the fovea over on the temporal side of the retina, and those are, um, well, that area corresponds to your central visual field. So it's really specialised for like high acuity colour vision. Um, and you've also got your optic disc and optic cup, which is the central part of the optic disc over on the nasal side of the retina. Um, and that correlates with the blind spot in your vision because there's no photoreceptors in that area. Um, and so you can tell, can anyone tell what eye this is from the, the picture, left or right? If the optic disc is nasally and the macula is temporal. Yell out. Left eye. Yeah, that's great. It's a left eye. Cool. Um, so the middle vascular layer, you've got the iris and ciliary body at the front. Um, and the ciliary body is important because it produces aqueous humour, which is the fluid that fills the front part of the eye. And then everywhere else is the choroid. So the choroid uh, provides a vascular supply to the, um, the posterior two thirds of the retina, but the full thickness of the fovea area. So the fovea is that central part, the central dip in the macula, which is the most specialised area for like high acuity colour vision. And the reason that, um, I guess, one of the useful things about this is that you don't have those retinal vessels crossing over the top of your fovea or the vascular supply comes from underneath. So it's not like disrupting um, the light rays. Cool. Um, the outer fibrous layer. So the cornea is at the front um, and it's a really um, interesting specialized tissue. It's a really sensitive tissue and it's really densely innervated. Um, and it's also completely avascular, so that's just something to remember. And because it's so densely innervated, it's going to be really painful if there's something irritating the cornea, which will be relevant later on. Um, you've got the limbus, which is the transitional part um, in between the cornea and the sclera. And then the sclera is the white of the eye, which actually blends with the meninges at the back. So some people say the eye is like an extension of the brain. Like it's got, it kind of blends with the, the outer coating of the brain. Cool. Um, so in terms of what happens when there's an issue with the cornea, I just thought we could talk about a couple of conditions quickly. So this one's called keratoconus. Um, and I don't think you need to know that much about it, but it's just... Um, what happens when the cornea becomes weak and bulges out like a cone. So it's the main indication for a corneal transplant in Australia. And interestingly, the treatment principles include wearing rigid contact lenses to like add some structural support to the cornea um, at the front. Cool. Um, and also astigmatism. So this is another condition where the cornea is not regular. Um, it's shaped like a football. So that means that the refractive power of the eye will depend on the angle of light that's coming through it. Um, so I don't know, some areas of the eye might be short-sighted, some parts might be long-sighted, and you treat that with a cylindric um, lens. All right, and the eyeball can also be divided into a few sections. So we can talk about it in terms of the anterior, the posterior segment first. Um, and the posterior segment contains the vitreous body. So that's the main structural, I guess, adds the structural integrity to the eye. And it's not really a dynamic circulation, like it's quite a static um, circulation. The vitreous just sits there in the back of the eye and provides structure. And then you've got the anterior segment, which is a bit more important in terms of pathology later on. Um, so that can be thought of in terms of the anterior and the posterior chamber. And the main relevance of this is the circulation of aqueous humour. So aqueous humour is the fluid that fills the anterior segment. It's made in the ciliary body. It flows forward through the, I guess, through the pupil anterior to the iris and then drains out through um, the trabecular meshwork through what's called the canal of Schlem and eventually it enters the venous circulation. Um, so the, the relevance of this will come later on when we talk about acute glaucoma. But yeah, just remember that you've got that dynamic circulation of aqueous humour in the front of the eye. All right, a quick note on refractive error. So um, we'll talk about <laughs> short-sightedness and far-sightedness. Far-sightedness, otherwise known as hyperopia, um, is when you have or usually a short eye or maybe a weak lens, which has like low converging power. 
Um, so instead of focusing on the retina, images focus behind the retina. So vision is better at long distances. So you're far sighted, you can see far, you can't see short. Um, and you correct that with a biconvex lens or a plus lens. Um, myopia is the opposite, short sightedness. So you might have a longer eye or a really thicker lens or a more curved cornea. And as a result, images, like I guess the eye is too good at refracting. So the images focus in front of the retina instead of on it. Um, so you use the opposite, a biconcave um, lens to treat that. Presbyopia is similar to hyperopia. Um, but it occurs with age. So you might notice like some changes to your vision, like in your 40s and 50s, and it's similar to a far-sighted pattern. Um, the treatment principles are also the same. And just a little note to remember that while we think about refractive error, usually in terms of the lens, actually the cornea is the main refractive surface of the eye. So like the curvature of the cornea provides the most refraction. Great. Oh, and um, the optic pathway. So I just wanted to mention what happens after the optic nerve leaves the eye and goes um, on into the brain. So hopefully this anatomy is, or well, you're pretty familiar with this, but I just wanted to talk about a couple of things that happen like when there are lesions along this pathway. So I think the most important things, pituitary tumor, bitemporal hemianopia, you guys probably remember that from like preclin, um, and also a PCA stroke, so a posterior cerebral artery stroke. It produces a hemianopia of the opposite side, so like a left-sided stroke will produce a right-sided homonymous hemianopia. But this, um, the visual deficit actually spares the macula, so the central um, part of the visual field will still be intact. Um, and the reason for that is because the occipital um, cortex of the brain, where in the macular region, has a dual blood supply. So it also receives some blood from the middle cerebral artery in order to, I suppose, in order to prevent against um, like events like a PCA stroke, eliminating your central vision. It's got two blood supplies. Okay, onto the lids, lashes and lacrimal system now. So this is the anatomy of the lacrimal system, like the tear system. So the tear film um, is produced in the main lacrimal gland and there's also sometimes accessory lacrimal glands, it then flows um, over the eye and it drains through the lacrimal puncta, down um, through the lacrimal sac, through the nasal lacrimal duct and eventually enters the nasal cavity. So in terms of what happens when the system is obstructed, it's most common in babies. So it's usually a congenital thing, like a membrane obstructing the nasal lacrimal duct. Um, but it can also occur in older people and could be post-trauma, post-infection. Um, the main symptom, as you might imagine, will be really watery, overflowing eyes, and that's called epiphoria. Um, they might have some discharge or crusting or maybe some blurred vision. Um, and it might be complicated by, you can see in the bottom picture there, the eye looks, um, it looks like they're in a bit of trouble. So that's a case of dacrocystitis, which is inflammation, um, often secondary to an infection based on like the stasis of the tear fluid within that nasal lacrimal duct. Um, so nasal lacrimal duct obstruction usually goes away spontaneously, like with age, but massaging the area can be helpful, like to try and, I guess, milk all the tear fluid down. Um, and if it's recurrent or if it occurs in older people, then you might think about like putting a probe down to try and clear the duct or even surgery or more invasive procedures. Eyelid anatomy, just quickly, um, I think the most important um, structures there are the tarsal plate, and that's the... Um, uh, the like darker orange thing at the bottom of the top eyelid. So that's what adds the structural integrity to the eye. Um, and extending upward from that, you've got the orbital septum. And that's a really important structure um, later on when we talk about infections of the eye, because it adds, um, it provides the structural like barrier to the front of the orbit. So if there's an infection like in front of or behind that orbital septum, that will have very different outcomes and different clinical presentation. Um, so we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so yeah, the orbital septum is important. And there's also some glands in the eye that we'll talk about in a moment. So you've got the meibomian glands, you can see labeled up there on the diagram, and those sit within that tarsal plate and they produce mebum. And you've also got the, got the glands of Zeiss, 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 which are sebaceous glands, which sit around the eyelash follicles. So those have some pretty neat pathological correlations. So um, you've got chalasian and cordiolum or sty. Um, a chalasian is what happens when your meibomian glands are obstructed. So that's a subacute, um, non-painful, non-infective, um, rubbery lesion, um, and you'll see it on the eyelid. Um, so it's caused by meibomian gland occlusion and secondary inflammation. Um, there are several risk factors, mostly things that make the meibomian gland secretions thicker. So that might be blepharitis, which we'll talk about later, and also a condition called rosacea, 
Um, so it usually clears spontaneously, but in terms of the management, there's this principle called eyelid hygiene, which we should talk about and will be relevant um, later on for us as well. So it basically involves using warm, wet compresses on the eye a few times a day, usually for like 10 or 15 minutes, just to sort of massage and help to relieve like um, any buildup of crusting and stuff. Um, you can also try and wash off any discharge or crusting with like a non-irritating soap or a baby shampoo. Um, and preventative measures, so like avoiding rubbing the eyes and, and contact lens hygiene and stuff. Um, so that's important for management, but usually they go away by themselves. Um, in terms of sty, so this is kind of uh, similar but different. It's acute, infected, painful. Um, it's a staph infection of those glands of zeiss around the eyelash follicle. Um, management principles, however, are fairly similar. So they usually just drain and they're usually self-resolving. Um, warm compresses and eyelid hygiene principles still apply. Um, rarely you can get a progression to periorbital cellulitis, which is an infection, um, just like a skin infection on the face. Um, and in that case, antibiotics will be warranted. Cool. Blepharitis now. So if you remember, this is one of the conditions that predisposes you to that meibomian gland obstruction and chalazion. Um, it's just chronic inflammation of the eyelid margins. I kind of like to think of it as like dandruff of the eyelids because the symptoms um, they'll present with like flaky skin and maybe a gritty feeling or like a foreign body sensation in the eye. Um, and the treatment principles, lid hygiene, once again, um, you can use topical lubricants and false tears. False tears will like never be wrong in Opthal pretty much because often they have like just general eye irritation symptoms and false tears are like really good for relieving um, symptoms of like a gritty, crusty eye. Um, and you can also consider long-term oral antibiotics similar to like acne treatment and things which you'll talk about in your GP teaching. Okay, um, ectropian and entropian. So, um, Ectropion is when the lower eyelid is turned out. Entropion is when it's turned in. Um, they're usually both like idiopathic or age related. Um, in terms of ectropion, uh, treat uh, symptoms primarily like tearing or watering eyes, but they also might paradoxically experience like dry eye symptoms. Um, so treatment is just supportive things, but definitive management is surgical. Entropion um, is Similar, but a little more dangerous because it might be complicated by this um, phenomenon called trichiasis, which is when the eyelashes also turn in. And uh, with like repeated scraping of eyelashes on the cornea, you can cause it to become cloudy and opaque and therefore like your vision will become impaired. Um, so treatment similar, you can have um, medical things as well, like a Botox to the orbicularis muscle, which is if it's related to like a muscular spasm causing everything to turn in. Um, but definitive treatment, again, surgical. And um, in the context of trichiasis, which is that inward turning of the eyelashes, I thought we should just briefly cover trachoma. So that's a chlamydial infection of the eye. It's different to the STI. It's uh, um, associated with like uh, lack of access to clean water. So it occurs in third world countries and in some indigenous populations in Australia. And it's quite important because it's the leading infectious cause of blindness in the world. Um, so it's very much preventable. And there are various public health strategies in place to prevent it. And the main one is shown up there on the screen, SAFE. It's an acronym. Um, but the mechanism by which trachoma causes blindness is by that um, trichiasis. So it causes the eye lower eyelashes to like turn in and repeatedly um, rub on and scar the cornea. All right, conjunctiva now. So the conjunctiva is an epithelium. Um, it's very highly vascularized, so anything that like irritates the conjunctiva will cause the eye to become really red. Um, there are various anatomical regions as well. So the bulbar conjunctiva is what covers the front of the eye, and that's continuous with the palpebral conjunctiva, which covers the backs of the eyelids. So when the eye's shut, you'll have like two layers of conjunctiva touching each other. Um, yeah, so in terms of what happens, a couple of issues with the conjunctiva, you've got these um, funny diseases called pinguicula and pterygium. I'm probably pronouncing that terribly wrong, but um, basically they're benign overgrowth of the conjunctival tissue, and they're both um, on the same spectrum of disease, and they're both secondary to chronic UV exposure. So that's why it's called like surfer's eye or farmer's eye sometimes, because those professions are like exposed to a lot of UV. Um, and it almost exclusively occurs on the nasal side of the eye, so like the medial conjunctiva, and it's thought that might be related to the shadow of the nose, like protecting the temporal part of the eye. But basically, they occur on the medial part. Um, so the top picture is that pinguicula, and that's pretty benign. It doesn't invade over the cornea. It's limited to the sclera. The lower picture is a pterygium, um, and that's a bit more dangerous because it can like invade over the cornea and therefore impinge on your visual field. So for that one, you might uh, need surgery, but otherwise treatment is supportive. 
Okay, conjunctivitis now. So hopefully most of you know pretty much what conjunctivitis is. I think the most important thing is to be able to differentiate between the three main types of conjunctivitis. So we'll talk about viral versus bacterial versus allergic now. Um, so viral is the most common. Um, it's usually unilateral, but you might have a history of starting off in one eye and then spreading to the other eye, like after a few days, maybe they're rubbing their eyes and, and stuff because it's very contagious. Um, it might be following a cold. So you might elicit a history of like a recent viral urti. Um, and it's often associated with lymphadenopathy in like the cervical or preauricular regions. It's usually caused by adenovirus, so it makes sense that it often follows a viral urti. Um, treatment is supportive. Bacterial conjunctivitis, it's usually bilateral. Um, it's associated with like a purulent discharge, so maybe a yellow-green discharge. Rather than association with um, a viral urti, it might be associated with a bacterial otitis media infection, and that has its own syndrome. Um, so the treatment is with antibacterial antibiotic drops. Allergic conjunctivitis is the third type and final type that we'll talk about. So like bacterial, it's usually bilateral. You might have really glassy, intensely pruritic or itchy eyes. It might be associated with chemosis, which you can see a bit of in that picture up on the screen there. So chemosis is conjunctival edema. So you'll see um, a really like protruding, like glistening conjunctiva. And chemosis can also be associated with um, like mucosal angioedema in anaphylaxis and stuff. So that's why it's relevant to allergic conjunctivitis. Um, and in the patient, you might get a family history or a past history of ATP or hay fever or something. Um, you treat that with topical antihistamine drops. Cool. Oh, we should also bear in mind that conjunctivitis isn't always primary. So it's often secondary to like a systemic bacterial um, infection as well. Oh, and these are a couple of tables which I found helpful. So. Um, you guys might like those for your revision as well, just how to differentiate between the various types. So now on to extraocular muscles briefly. Um, hopefully you know the muscles around the eye. So you've got the four rectus muscles and the superior and inferior oblique muscles. Um, in terms of the innervation, they're all innervated by cranial nerve three, except for the superior oblique, which is the trochlear nerve, and the lateral rectus, which is the abducens nerve. Um, and I'll let you guys read up about how to isolate the muscles for testing and things in your own time. I found that quite difficult to understand um, in the first instance, so I might need a bit of reading around. Um, and there's just a summary of the innervation. Oh, in terms of how cranial nerve palsies manifest in the eye, so cranial nerve six is pretty easy. They just won't be able to abduct the eye on the affected side because there's only one muscle and it's an easy one to, to test. Cranial nerve three, um, classically, you've got this down and out pupil. Um, they might also have a ptosis because the muscle that lifts, the, elevates the eyelid, the levator palpebrae superioris muscle, is also innervated by cranial nerve three. Um, they might also have some difficulty focusing because of the parasympathetic action of cranial nerve three. So that's like lens accommodation. Um, pupil constriction stuff. Um, yeah, so that one's especially concerning for a PCOM aneurysm, if you remember the anatomy of the, the vessels in the brain. Um, cranial nerve four is the most subtle. You might find that the patient turns their head away from the side of the lesion, and in short, that's because the affected eye cannot intort. So um, you intort your good eye and look away from the side of the lesion. You guys can think about that if it doesn't make sense. It's okay. Just remember, they, they might turn their head away from the affected side. Summary of that. Cool. Strabismus now, confusingly known as squint because they're not actually squinting, it's just um, the eyes are misaligned. It's most common in children and it's usually idiopathic um, or congenital. In, in order to test if someone has a strabismus, you can use the Hirschberg test, which is a fancy way of saying shine a light in the eye and look at the reflection. And if it's symmetrical, you're all good. But if it's not in the pupil on both sides, then you might be alerted that there's a strabismus. Um, you can also use cover testing, which is when you like cover and then um, cover the affected eye, ask the patient to fixate on something in front of them, uncover the affected eye and maybe cover the good eye and you'll observe the fixating if the pupil was deviated, like you might see it move from lateral to medial or something. Um, it's often asymptomatic and that can be quite dangerous because it's very important to treat um, a strabismus before the child gets too old because like it can cause some um, visual deficits later on, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, and you can see that a strabismus can be any direction. So it could be up, down, in or out. Um, and those all have different names and associations. But uh, the most common is an esotropia or a convergent squint. You can see um, Ryan Gosling has an exotropia there. All right, oh, an important differential is pseudostrabismus. So this patient, this baby is actually fine. It just has um, slightly slight asymmetry of like the epicanthal folds over the eye. So make sure you do your thorough um, Hirschberg and cover test to, to differentiate because this one's more common. 
And amblyopia is the, the complication that I was alluding to earlier for an untreated strabismus, among other issues with kids' eyes, but strabismus is the main one. Um, if it goes untreated beyond the age of about eight, you get this complication where the brain switches off the, the visual signal from the eye that's affected, and that's because of the interference in the visual fields, and the brain just can't be bothered um, worrying about processing that, so it just switches off the bad eye to eliminate um, the confusion. Um, so it's also known as cortical blindness because the eye itself is fine, but the cortex, so it's like blindness originating from the brain, not the eye. Um, yeah, so there are various causes of it, um, and patching is one of the treatment principles because you want to encourage use of the amblyopic eye before it gets completely switched off. Um, and it's very serious because it's, it's permanent. You can't reverse this condition after the age of about eight when the visual pathways are completely matured. If the brain switches off that eye, you, you can't do anything to switch it back on. Okay, so we'll talk about a few causes of a unilateral red eye now. And I remember when I was doing GP, they like to emphasize that a unilateral red eye is actually quite dangerous. And there are a lot of important differentials to exclude before you say, oh, it's just conjunctivitis. So it's usually not conjunctivitis. And these are some of the things it could be. Um, so the most important, well, not the most important, but an important one is acute closed angle glaucoma or ACAG. Um, so it's characterized by um, optic nerve damage secondary to raised intraocular pressure. And it, the words closed angle imply that there's a, an actual physical obstruction to the outflow of the aqueous humor in the eye. So if you remember, the aqueous humor is produced by the ciliary body. It then flows forward in front, like through the pupil in front of the iris and out through the canal of Schlem, as it's labeled up there on the diagram. Um, so when the iris comes, if the iris were to come to like rest up against the lens, that obstructs the outflow of the aqueous humor and causes the pressure in the eye to rise and rise and rise and eventually damage the optic nerve can cause the patient to go blind. So this is an emergency, um, and as I mentioned, it arises when the lens rests against the iris. The risk is highest with a hyperopic eye, so that's a short eye, if you remember from before. So all the structures in the anterior chamber are very close together, um, and also a mid-dilated pupil, because that's the position of the iris where it's most likely to come up against the lens. Um, there are several other risk factors that you can read about. The presentation is sudden onset eye pain and headache. They might have blurred vision. They might see halos around lights, secondary to like corneal edema. They might have reduced visual fields. Um, they may also have more systemic symptoms. So if a patient with an eye problem has like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, you should think about glaucoma. It's like a systemic response to, to the severe um, problem in the eye. Um, yeah, so it's often precipitated by pupil dilation. So you might have a history of like an old lady sitting down to watch TV in the evening and suddenly like saw a red eye. And that's because the pupil has dilated and the iris has just come up um, against the lens and that's when it, when it happens. All right, so diagnosis is on examination. Gonioscopy is like a specialized lens to look through the slit lamp. Um, and the management principles are listed there. Um, for most of these acute eye problems, you would definitely not be wrong. And you should say in an OSCE setting that you would like to refer, like send them straight to the eye and ear or like refer to the ophthalmology team because um, a GP wouldn't be managing um, this in the, in the practice that'd be sent to the ED. Um, there are several things you can do. You should constrict the pupil, um, reduce the formation of aqueous humor, and give various diuretics to dehydrate the vitreous. Definitive management is with a laser peripheral iridotomy, and you do that on both eyes um, because they're quite likely to, to have an attack in the other eye if they've got the process going on in one eye. Okay, so now onto those infections that I was talking about in the context of that orbital septum before. So first we'll talk about periorbital or preceptal cellulitis. That's an infection anterior to the orbital septum. So it's basically a skin infection on the face that happens to be in the eye area. Um, it's usually caused by spread of infection from like an insect bite or an injury near to the, near to the eye. Um, and importantly, it's limited to that preceptal area. So that's really important. Um, and you, you just treat it with antibiotics. Um, but the important differential is orbital cellulitis. So this one is an emergency. It's when the infection is behind the orbital septum. So it's actually like in the orbit itself. Um, so they get a CT, IV antibiotics, like urgent opthal review and transfer them to the ED um, because it's a site threatening condition. And there's a risk that it could progress to meningitis as well. Um, because if you remember that the outside of the eye is continuous with the meninges um, around the brain. Uh, it's rather than like a local um, scratch or insect bite on the face, it's usually caused by extension of infection from the sinuses or maybe around the teeth, so like a periodontal abscess or something. Um, and you give them IV antibiotics and you can find the, the recommendations on ETG um, 
So this is just a diagram to illustrate the anatomy that I was talking about. So you can see um, preceptal cellulitis is really limited to in front of that orbital septum. And that's really good that the orbital septum's there as a barrier to prevent the infection from getting into the eye. Whereas orbital cellulitis is uh, diffusely involving the whole orbit. Um, and it might be complicated by various abscesses and even cavernous sinus thrombosis as well. Um, clinically, periorbital cellulitis, uh, I guess, take home buzzwordy things. The patient is well and the eye examination is normal. Um, so like normal visual acuity and eye movements. In orbital cellulitis, you might see a prominent um, proptosis. So like the eye might be pushed forward by the infection or an abscess behind it. You might, uh, likely you'll also see an abnormal eye examination to some extent. So like the eye might be really red. You might have reduced visual acuity. You might have painful eye movements. Um, you might also see in both cases like evidence of the primary, like original source of infection. So like in periorbital cellulitis, maybe there's an insect bite nearby on the face. In orbital cellulitis, maybe they've had a recent sinusitis or a tooth infection. Good. Um, on this is what they look like. So you can see periorbital cellulitis up on the left. Um, the patient, the eye underneath looks fine. There's some mild redness around the eye, but it's not really limited to the margins of the orbit. Whereas in orbital cellulitis, there's a really good going proptosis and chemosis there. Um, the patient does not look well. Um, the eyes are closed, and I'm sure that patient has painful visual movements and painful eye movements and reduced visual acuity. Um, this is a complication of an orbital cellulitis, so it's a subperiosteal abscess. So that's why you do a CT in all of those patients. Iritis now. So this is uh, inflammation, inflammation in the anterior um, chamber. So it's usually idiopathic, but about half of these patients have one of those HLA B27 or like rheumatic um, auto-inflammatory conditions. Um, clinically, they present with a painful red eye. Um, when you look at the eye, you might see um, that the redness is most concentrated around the limbal area. So that's kind of a buzzwordy thing for this condition, a perilimbal or circumciliary injection. And that's just related to um, what's the ciliary body in the iris that's inflamed. So that's where the conjunctiva is gonna be like red. Um, you diagnose it on slit lamp exam, usually you'll see white cells in the anterior chamber and the late stage of that is called hypopion where there's actually like an air fluid, like a fluid level of pus sitting in the, sitting in the anterior chamber. Um, you may also see posterior synechiae or an irregular um, pupil because the iris might be so inflamed that it like sticks to the um, lens or something. Um, you can get a secondary glaucoma from that as well. So treatment is anti-inflammatories, but you wouldn't manage that in the GP setting. They would go to the INE or to the ophthalmologist. Oh, and these are some of those um, clinical signs we were talking about. So um, I'll just tell you what they are because we kind of push for time. We've got the hypopion, which is the fluid level of pus, um, which you might see in like a really good going late stage, like anterior uveitis. Perilimbal injection. So in that middle eye, it's most red around the limbus. Um, and also posterior synechiae, um, which is when the pupils are regular. So those are just a few things to, buzzwordy things to remember for um, anterior uveitis or iritis. Um, and also to know that these conditions also exist, so intermediate and posterior uveitis, but I won't go into them today. They're very rare um, associated with systemic inflammatory diseases. Episcleritis. So this is um, a benign self-limited condition. It's characterized by inflammation of the episclera. So that's like a thin line of tissue that overlies the sclera. Um, it looks like a wedge shaped, like red eye. So the whole eye isn't red. It's just like a wedge uh, part of the um, the the eye, yeah. So they might have some mild discomfort, but it won't be severe pain. They won't have like a, a discharge or anything. Um, and it's usually idiopathic, but can also be associated with those connective tissue disorders. Um, so yeah, this young women are at greatest risk and you should basically just reassure them and it will resolve in days to weeks. But unfortunately recurrence is common, um, but you can use NSAID or steroid drops maybe in, in an ophthalmology setting. That should be differentiated, however, from scleritis. So this is a um, severe condition. Well, it can be severe if you get like necrotizing forms as in the bottom picture, um, it can be vision threatening. So it's also most common in like slightly older women, but still like, you know, youngish women. And it's usually idiopathic, but it can also be associated with connective tissue disorders. Um, in order to differentiate it from episcleritis, you'll see in scleritis that it, the eye is diffusely red. So it's not a weird shape. It's the whole thing that looks red. Um, they have a more severe, deep, like boring pain that can wake you from sleep. Um, also photophobia and like lacrimation, so tearing, are more um, commonly seen in scleritis than episcleritis. Um, and in order to do this clinically, like differentiate between the two, because the sclera is deeper than the episclera, in scleritis, um, 
the eye won't blanch with like topical phenylephrine drops and you won't be able to actually use a cotton swab to like move the inflamed vessels around. Whereas in episcleritis, because it's more superficial, you put some phenylephrine drops and the redness blanches and you use a cotton tip and the vessels will move. Um, yeah, so you treat with NSAID drops or like systemic corticosteroids depending on um, the form, but you again wouldn't manage this as a, a GP. Corneal abrasion now. So this is literally um, just, just when the cornea is, there's like a structural disruption. So it's usually caused by mechanical trauma. Maybe they poked a stick in their eye or something like that. Um, it's usually very painful because as we mentioned, the cornea is like really densely innervated. Um, you diagnose it on examination and you can see it really, the fluorescein really highlights it, especially when it's examined under a blue light. Um, so management is you should use topical antibiotic uh, drops just to prevent infection and you need to consider pseudomonal cover in contact lens wearers because they're colonised with pseudomonas. Um, oral analgesia as well, daily review and keep the contacts out until uh, it's healed if they wear contacts because you don't want like festering infection trapped in by contact lenses on the eye. Um, that's right. They usually heal very quickly. Um, so yeah, they're usually not painful after the first 24 hours. Um, they might be complicated by this syndrome called recurrent corneal erosion syndrome, um, but that's uncommon. Corneal foreign body now. So um, you should examine any eye with like an injury for a corneal foreign body. Um, the treatment is very simple, just remove the foreign material. If it's right in the centre of the pupil or something, maybe you'd want to refer to do that rather than doing it in your GP or emergency department setting, but I guess it depends on the um, your experience. Um, and you should also remove a rust ring or health revision. If you have like a steel or iron foreign body, you use a burr to remove the rust ring around it. Um, same principles for corneal abrasion apply. So topical antibiotics, oral analgesia, not anaesthetic drops, and daily review. Um, additional things, so you need to exclude intraocular penetration. So you need a really low threshold to like scan these patients with a CT of their eye or something and make sure there's nothing left inside the eye. Um, also make sure you evert the eyelids when you're looking for a foreign body. So um, especially if you see like a lot of vertical corneal abrasions, that should indicate that you need to avert the eyelid because that might be something sitting underneath scraping on the cornea over and over. Um, and occupational health, so if this happened at work, like advice about eyewear and, and PPE at work. Intraocular foreign body, so this is like the dreaded um, occupational health complication. So you need to have a really low threshold to scan patients, as we mentioned. So if there's any thought that, oh, maybe there's something gone into the eye, just do a scan. Um, and you have the highest clinical suspicion if they've been using like metal on metal hammering or something. So the classic demographic is like young working men who are hammering metal and then they feel something into their eye and surprise it did. And so you need to treat it. Um, so you can manage it with surgical removal usually. And this bottom picture shows an eye shield. So you can make one of those with a paper cup. And the reason you need to shield the eye is because there might be um, like a hidden sort of penetration. It's pretty gross, but like if there's something that touches the eye, you don't want all the eye contents to like extra vasate, like squirt out. Yeah. So don't put pressure on the eye for that reason because something's gone into it. So there might be a defect remaining, right? But they're often self-sealing, but maybe not. Cool. Um, bacterial eye infections now. So corneal, ulcer, corneal infections or microbial keratitis might go on to become a corneal ulcer and that can be site threatening if it's not caught early. These ones, the only, like, if you're going to remember one thing, just remember contact lenses for this condition. So contact lens wearers probably in a classic like MCQ is who's going to get this um, because it's usually caused by pseudomonas um, and you might get a history of like leaving your contacts in for too long or not disinfecting your contacts or swimming in your contacts or some problem with contact lens hygiene which has then gone on to, to a pseudomonal infection and an ulcer in the eye. Um, so you diagnose it clinically, the ulcer should stain with fluorescein um, but you can take like a corneal scraping and send it off. Um, management is with quite intensive topical antibiotics and you should stop your contact lenses and also provide like education and, and stuff to the patient. So these are some corneal ulcers you can see there and you really need to be aware um, in a GP setting for any reason of using topical steroids because one of the feared complications is that using topical steroids in a corneal ulcer could perforate the cornea. Um, so if you're considering steroids then you should refer them on to an ophthalmologist. Okay, so viruses can also cause corneal ulcers and the most important one to remember is HSV. Um, I won't talk much about this. You can see the really characteristic dendritic appearance of the HSV ulcer. Um, you just diagnose it with fluorescein and you manage it with topical acyclovir. Herpes zoster is another virus that can affect the eye. So does anyone remember that sign when there's shingles on the tip of the nose? Do you remember what it's called? Hutchinson's, nice, yeah, Hutchinson's sign. So if you see Hutchinson's sign, that indicates that there is like 
herpes zoster virus in the, the V1 distribution of the, the cranial nerve. So um, you need to like examine the eye if that's the case. Um, and that warrants like quite intensive treatment with oral antivirals, topical steroids. Um, but your GP implication is make sure your 70 to 79s get their shingles vaccine. Photokeratitis, just so you know what it is, it's just like a sunburn of the cornea and you just treat it with oral analgesia and remember your occupational health. So welders should be wearing eye protection, basically. Subconjunctival hemorrhage it looks a bit scary, but actually it's very benign. Um, the only thing is you need to take the patient's blood pressure because this condition might be associated with hypertension. It might also be associated with like increased intra-abdominal pressure. So if you're coughing or straining postpartum mothers and babies um, and like minor trauma to the eye. So yeah, it usually resolves without treatment. So that's fine. Just reassurance and check their blood pressure and treat hypertension. Sudden visual loss now. So these are a few ocular emergencies. You would always refer these patients to the eye anneal or the ophthalmology service at your hospital. Temporal arteritis, hopefully you know about. It's a vasculitis, which affects the temporal artery. So the classic history is like um, tenderness when they're brushing their hair over the temporal artery, uh, jaw claudication, um, and it might involve the ophthalmic artery leading to visual changes or visual loss. So it's important to diagnose um, basically and treat immediately with, with high dose corticosteroids. Central retinal artery occlusion. So the classic sign for this, you can see up on the picture there, is a cherry red spot. So um, the cherry red spot is the macula and the fovea. And the reason it looks so bright red in this condition is because the surrounding um, retina is ischemic and pale. So it's nothing, the cherry red spot is not the pathology. It's the pale retina around it that makes it look red. That's the pathology. And the reason the retina is ischemic and pale is because there's a, uh, an embolus in the retinal artery. So these patients have painless visual loss and they'll probably also have various embolic or vascular risk factors. So hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and so on. Um, so you see a cherry red spot. Management is to dislodge the embolus. So there are various ways to do this. Um, you can get them to hyperventilate and inhale carbon dioxide, which is a vasodilator. You can massage the eye, which like raises and then lowers the intraocular pressure and might dislodge it. Um, you can consider other more invasive things as well. Um, and you should follow them up with carotid um, ultrasound to look for like carotid artery stenosis and stuff, which is where the, the embolus might have originated from. Central retinal vein occlusion is um, the same idea, but it, it's occlusion of the vein, not the artery. Um, and you get that characteristic thunderscopic appearance, which looks like a, a stormy sky or like a, a thunderstorm retinal appearance. Um, and the biggest risk factors are hypertension and age. And I think the mechanism of the hypertension is that like, if you have a really hard artery traveling in a common sheath with like a soft compressible vein, it can cause the vein to be occluded and that's the appearance. Um, management is directed at complications. Um, you kind of are trying to hope that it resolves itself and you have some vision left. It's not a, like an emergency treatment right away kind of condition. And just like you can have central retinal artery and vein occlusion, you can also have branch retinal artery and vein occlusion. So you'll see the same clinical signs, but they happen in the distribution of one of the smaller branch arteries rather than like the big central artery. So like in the artery occlusion, you can see that the pallor of the retina just follows the distribution of the small arteries. Great. Posterior vitreous detachment. Sorry, guys, thanks for, um, thanks for bearing with me. We're, we're getting there. Um, it's when the posterior vitreous separates from the retina. It's just an age-related thing. And the presentation is with sudden onset um, flashes and floaters in the eye. So that's just caused by the, the stimulus on the retina from the posterior vitreous peeling off. Um, the Flashes and floaters though, are usually benign, but this is just a condition to, to look out for in older people. Um, the, the feared complication with this one is a retinal detachment. So that's when the posterior vitreous also pulls off, like causes a tear in the retina, and then like the vitreous fluid can get underneath and cause the retina to like peel off the choroid. Um, and that like causes reduction in your vision. Um, so we'll talk about that now. Um, the most common cause, as I mentioned, is a retinal tear in the context of a posterior vitreous detachment, just because of the tractional effect. Yeah. Um, the symptoms are the same, the flashes and floaters, but they also have visual impairment. So they might say there's like a, a blackness coming across their vision in the distribution of the retina that's being peeled off. Um, and if the macula is involved, that's really bad um, because it's usually permanent and it means that they've lost their central vision. Um, diagnosis on examination, and there are various treatment principles, including laser, and you can use the bottom, um, the bottom picture there, that's a scleral buckle to like put some more pressure on the eye and hold everything together. Um, you can take out the vitreous and fill the eye with gas um, to, to just help seal the retina back on. Um, 
Vitreous hemorrhage is bleeding in the vitreous. There are so many things that can cause it, um, but the reason I put it here is because it can be caused by a posterior vitre vitreous detachment or a retinal detachment because if like the, um, the vessels are disrupted and they bleed out into the eye. Um, so you need to screen them for the cause of the bleed. Um, you'll diagnose it on examination because you know the red reflex when you like shine a light in the eye, you won't get one in, in these patients because there's blood in between um, like the front of the eye and the choroid, which is what usually gives the red reflex. Um, management is directed at the cause. Um, so I won't go into that too much. Amaurosis fugax is one of those weird conditions. It's like a TIA of the eye. Um, they present with painless, transient, unilateral visual loss. So just a curtain coming down over their vision and it goes away in like half an hour or an hour or something. Um, and it's, these patients also have like clotting or thromboembolic risk factors because that's the, the mechanism of it. Um, but the main implication for this condition is that these patients have a really high stroke risk now after having this. They have a 2% risk per year of having a stroke. So you need to like aggressively control their stroke risk factors. Gradual visual loss. So we're getting to the questions. We'll be there in a few minutes. Um, so cataract is an important one to think about. Hopefully you guys know what this is. It's just an opacification of the lens. So it's the most common curable cause of blindness. Um, and it usually comes from the nucleus, which is the middle part of the lens, but also it can arise from other areas as well. Um, there are several risk factors, the most common ones being age and diabetes, um, family history and various congenital um, causes can, can be a factor as well. So clinical presentation will be, it's a gradual thing. So they'll have gradual like onset, painless visual um, reduction in their visual acuity. Um, they might have blurry or cloudy vision and kind of a buzzwordy thing is that they have like a glare around lights. So like a glare around headlights at night. That means in an older like person with these risk factors, they probably have a cataract. Um, they also have an absent red reflex, as you can see in that eye, um, the, the eye on the left, um, it's got a cataract and they don't have a red reflex when you shine the light. Definitive management is surgical, so you just take out the, the lens and replace um, it with a clear one. Chronic glaucoma is the same thing as acute glaucoma, but without that blockage to the aqueous humor circulation. So it's just they have raised intraocular pressure without that obstructive cause, and it causes damage to the optic nerve. So rather than an acute, painful red eye, these people just present chronically with a gradual peripheral visual loss. And it's peripheral because of the mechanism of optic nerve compression by the increased pressure. Um, so that's important. Remember, it's peripheral because another condition we'll talk about is an important differential, and it's a central visual loss. Um, you can diagnose it on examination. So tonometry is when you like press something on the eye and gauge the intraocular pressure. Fundoscopy, just looking in the eye, you'll see this cup disc ratio um, will be elevated. And um, you'll talk about this a bit more in your GP teaching, but like the optic cup is the central part of the optic disc, which is the like a depression of the nerve. And I'll show that in a picture in a minute. Treatment, they use um, drops. So prostaglandin analogs and beta blocker drops. Um, last line or third line is laser, just like um, the acute glaucoma, to just really make sure that there is a good aqueous humor outflow. And this is that um, cupping phenomenon that I was just talking about. So you can see that the optic cup is the central depression of the optic disc. And obviously, if there's increased pressure inside the eye, that's the, the mechanism of the increased cupping. So like it pushes the optic nerve down and out, and, and that's why you get the peripheral um, visual loss, because the peripheral optic nerve fibers are, are compressed and damaged. Macular degeneration now. So this is a chronic um, condition. It causes irreversible visual loss in older people. Um, and the buzzword for this is drusen. So those are those hard exudates that you can see in the bottom picture in the macular area of the eye. Those are drusen. They're different from the hard exudates in diabetic retinopathy. It's just a different um, layer of the retina that they, they affect. Um, there are dry or wet forms. So the dry form is like the, the precursor to the wet form, which is when you have like neovascularization, so new, friable, new blood vessels growing in the eye, and those cause the, the main um, burden of disease for these patients. Management is supportive. It's thought that a high antioxidant diet can help, so various vitamin supplements um, and things. And if it's the wet form, so if there's new vessels growing in the eye, they get anti-VEGF injections. Um, as well. So VEGF vascular endothelial growth factor, you give like anti-VEGF injections and you reduce the, the stimulus for the new vessel growth. Ampsler grid, this is what they people with macular degeneration use to monitor their um, disease. So the idea is you look at the dot right in the middle of the grid and then um, people with macular degeneration might see these wavy shapes um, rather than like the straight lines. And they use that to monitor how the disease is going over time, if it's worsening, and then they'll go back to the doctor and report. 
Diabetic retinopathy now, hopefully this is mostly um, revision, so I won't go too much into it, but it has implications, um, a lot of implications for your GP teaching. So make sure you stick to your RACGP guidelines and, and mention for diabetic patients, they need their thorough eye exam every two years, more frequent if they have complications. Um, and you also screen for the other microvascular complications, which we'll talk about in a minute. It can be like macular degeneration, it can be dry or non-proliferative or wet or proliferative. Um, so that just is difference in clinical signs. Management principles are treat the diabetes, prevent it from progressing to the proliferative form. So you can use those same anti-VEGF injections. Steroid injections can help, like injections into the eye. I know, pretty gross. Um, and you can also use laser. So that reduces by like sacrificing the peripheral retina by like ablating it with a laser. That reduces the hypoxic or ischemic stimulus for new vessel growth in the eye. So the idea is you sacrifice your peripheral vision to keep these new vessels from going over and disrupting your central vision. Yeah. So you're basically just destroying the outer retina. Um, so it's pretty scary. So you'd rather be preventing these things. Um, on these are the GP guidelines for your reference later on um, for all the microvascular complications of diabetes. Those are really good guidelines to have a look at if you've got um, time in your GP treats. Um, and these are some diabetic eyes that have some complications. So you've got a non-proliferative eye, you can see some hard exudates. You've got the proliferative retinopathy, so you can see those really unusual looking new vessels growing over and they're extending towards the, the macula, which is quite concerning. Um, and the third eye is an eye that's undergone a laser photocoagulation. So the, the peripheral retina has been like destroyed with laser in order to preserve the central retina. Sure. Okay, so we'll start with some questions. So what do you guys think for this one? So this is a classic story for temporal arteritis. Um, it's a 71-year-old man with a right-sided throbbing headache and associated loss of vision. All good? Cool. These are from your the past papers that you guys can access. They're all on Aquella, by the way. Yeah, perfect. Acute glaucoma. Pain radiates to the forehead, nausea, vomiting, um, unresponsive mid-dilated pupil. Contact lenses, what's that one? Nice, corneal ulcer, perfect. So it's, it's caused by, though, microbial keratitis. Like, it's a bacterial infection of the eye that causes an ulcer. So this one is a preceptal cellulitis. The bee sting might make you think it's allergy, but actually it's not. This is three days later. Um, the upper lid is tender and swollen. Um, it's just a skin infection secondary to the bee sting. So this one is just a simple viral conjunctivitis. The eye is fine. The patient's fine. Um, there's just some conjunctival injection, so it's just supportive treatment. Yeah. I'll put all these slides up, you guys, um, after. What's this one? You guys know this one from the picture. <laughs> That's great. It's an HSV dendritic ulcer. So what's the treatment? Antiviral ointment. Yeah? Cool. You don't even need to read the question for that, right? <laughs> but you still should. It is conjunctivitis, but it's not bacterial. Yeah, nice. So you treat that with the antihistamine drops. It's an allergic conjunctivitis. The patient has really itchy eyes. And chemosis. This one we didn't get time to talk about. I'll tell you, it's a case of optic neuritis. The main thing there is it's a young woman with painful eye movements. She should be investigated for MS. And they have an RAPD, like a Marcus Gunn pupil. Okay, this is papilledema. These are just a few spot diagnoses. A blowout fracture in the bottom of the eye, and they can't look up because some of the eye contents have, contents have like extravasated down um, because the weakest part of the orbit is fractured. This is raccoon eyes and a basal skull fracture. These are just kind of things in case you want to, just for your knowledge. Um, and these are some problems with the iris. So Kaiser Flesher rings in Wilson's disease, Arcus senilis and hypercholesterolemia. And this is an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, which is a rare condition, but you should just remember the clinical signs just in case it comes up. So on the affected side, they won't be able to, to look um, 
laterally. This is the blue sclera of osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, and these are some of the complications of putting steroids in the eye. So you shouldn't do it if you're a GP. You should send it um, to the ophthalmologist and they can talk about steroid drops. Cool. These are some resources for you. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me and all my slides will be up for you to look at later.